tools for everyone. I am excited that you're here today and uh, looking forward to spending a couple hours uh, talking about universal positive practices. My name is Kathleen Deppler. I'm the Director of Positive Supports for Missouri's Division of Developmental Disabilities. And um, I really love talking about tools, so I'm glad you're here today. Um, <clears throat> for the best experience today, um, I'm going to ask you to stay muted, although I uh, don't think you're actually able to unmute, so that should be pretty easy. And I'm going to encourage you to um, <clears throat> utilize the chat box, which you'll find in the bottom right corner of your screen. It says chat. Um, and when you use that chat, chat box, please chat everyone. Um, that's going to be the best way for us to interact today. Um, and this is an interactive training. So um, use that chat box. And I would also encourage you to grab some paper for notes. And we're going to do a few activities. So it would be nice if you had um, some paper to sketch out your ideas. <clears throat> so today <clears throat> you're going to have the opportunity to learn about what universal strategies is. We're going to share some fundamental facts of behavior. Uh, so the underlying reasons for the strategies that we're suggesting. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the categories of behavior. We're going to give you four types, and that can help you identify some target behaviors for change. We're also going to talk about coercion and punishment and the effects. And when we talk about coercion and punishment and the effects, I think it will highlight why we suggest uh, that you try to avoid those. Um, we're going to give you 10 common examples or 10 examples of common coercions. Um, and we're also going to provide some strategies for some proactive preventative things that you can do to uh, increase the positivity in the environment. So, again, I want to orient you to the chat box on the right bottom of your screen and um, let's use that. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, we're going to talk about universal positive practices. We're going to talk about motivating desirable behavior um, and we're going to talk about um, positive practices. So, you know, one common thing that we know uh, is that people try to stamp out behavior. That's a common way to get rid of it. Um, so I'd love to hear um, from, from you guys in the chat box, you know, what does that look like? Um, how have you tried to get rid of bad behavior in the past or bad habits in the past? Um, what are some strategies that, that you've used um, to get rid of bad or undesirable behaviors. Sometimes when people talk about getting rid of bad or undesirable behaviors, um, you know, things look like telling someone to stop. That's a strategy that you might use in the moment. Um, <clears throat> what are some other ways that you've tried to, or what are some ways you've tried to get rid of bad behaviors in the past? Redirection or attempting to turn the turn. Thanks, you guys are, these are coming in fast. Uh, wow. Um, Attempt to turn the negative into a positive. Okay, restrictions or timeout. Lisa says. Uh, Kat says grounding. Uh, Maslin says timeout. So those are pretty pretty similar. Some common themes here. Redirect is another one. An award system. Kathy says. Um, Natalie says ignoring. Um, or if the intent of the behavior is to get attention, um, that adds some clarity. Thank you. So ignore if the behavior uh, of intent is attention. Um, and then um, using humor. Okay, those are great. So that's those are some really I've I've heard most of those modeling replacement behaviors. Jeremy says, okay, um, heard lots of these before. A couple of them definitely represent that stamp out idea, and a few of them also represent the shift towards positive. Like modeling replacement behaviors, I think is a great example of that shift towards um, positive strategies. So. Let's talk about what we mean. Thank you for your uh, sharing and participation. Uh, let's talk about what we mean about positive behavior support. So there's really a lot that goes into this um, this definition. So the the science of behavior analysis 
or the science of behavior, has been formally investigated and demonstrating the science of behavior since the 1940s. There are hundreds of thousands of studies and demonstrations of these principles and techniques and many programs and treatment projects, schools, um, training curriculums uh, use the principles and science of behavior. Uh, positive behavior support uses the public health model as a structure for these positive behavior support interventions. So for these positive practice interventions. So using this triangle you see here on the slide, the <clears throat> red, yellow, green, um, I want to explain this uh, public health model strategy for implementing positive behavior support. So um, when you look at when you look at the bottom, this green base, it represents the universal strategies that support the quality of life for an entire population. 80 to 90% of people will need only um, those universal healthy positive practices for a high quality of life. And then when you look at that next layer, that yellow layer, um, that center represents the population of people at risk for poor outcomes. So the interventions of this population often look like an extra scoop of that universal strategy, that green, that green area at the bottom, the basis of everything else, um, it often looks like an extra scoop. Um, and it's a targeted intervention um, that's intended to be short term and faded as risk decreases into just that universal level of support. And then um, if you look at that top, the, that red at the top of the triangle, that represents those, those people in crisis and in need of short-term intensive supports. And in a healthy population, five to 10, five percent of people might need this level of support. So it's important to talk about this because today's content is all that green. This is universal stuff. This is not... Um, these aren't strategies that you might use with a person with disabilities or strategies you might use with uh, children or adolescents. Um, these are strategies that everybody needs um, to, for a high quality of life, to build strong relationships um, and to live a life free of coercion. So it's important that we um, that, that we talk about this because these strategies are not intended to you know, solve all the problems. They're really intended to be the base of any other intervention. If we're not using these uh, universal positive practices consistently and with fidelity, then all those other other interventions that we might uh, that we might provide a person are going to be less effective because we haven't done that base level of support. So that's what this training is really about, this base level of support that, um, that everybody needs for a high quality of life. Now, this shift to positive practices can be difficult um, because it is a big shift. It's a cultural shift. Um, and so the focus of this shift is really to focus on being kind and caring all the time, we want to avoid making things worse for people. You know, we don't have to be mean or cold or angry or upset um, when when someone's having a hard time to, to teach them the other thing. Being kind and not emotional can be more effective in calming a situation down. Um, so we really want to avoid creating those worsenings for people. We want to keep our cool. Um, we want to avoid taking things personally or, or emotionally, even when they feel very personal and emotional. Um, and, you know, making this shift doesn't mean that people are getting away with undesirable behavior. It means we're responding in a different way. And that's really hard because we have practiced coercion a lot. We've practiced um, providing, uh, you know, punitive kind of consequences. Um, our society does that. So it's been modeled for us. That's why we practiced it so much. It's what we've seen. Um, and so, you know, this is really a counter approach to a lot of what we've been taught and what we've experienced and seen ourselves. So, um, it is a big shift and I would encourage you to be, um, avoid being, being, uh, cynical, um, about, about the strategies, but skeptic, skeptical is great, you know, weighing the evidence, um, for the strategies that we're suggesting and, um, uh, that that's certainly encouraged. And another thing I would say is, you know, this is a universal strategy. So as we go through this content today, I, I would ask that you 
think universally about this? Are there, is there an important relationship in your life? You know, this doesn't have to be about work or anything. It's really about being a community member and being um, um, a helpful, positive uh, force in the community. So think of those other relationships in your life that are important to you and how these strategies might affect those relationships and make them stronger. So let's talk, what is behavior? If you had to explain behavior to um, somebody who doesn't speak English, somebody who just has no concept, how would you explain behavior? Go ahead and go to the chat box and tell us what is behavior? What's your definition for behavior? Mel says actions. Yes, that's great. Can be a method of communication. Oh, you guys are fast. This is going. Okay. Um, Beth says can be a method of communication. Carol says a way someone conducts themselves. That's great. Um, Maslin says anything that a person does that's measurable and observable. It's like textbook right there. Uh, Shelly says how can you, how you conduct yourself. Action, uh, Kathy says action, trying to address a need. These are great. Sheila, uh, learned and interactive. Lisa says communication and reaction to the environment or situation, how someone reacts to their emotions. Cassandra says these are great. Um, there's some themes here that I see. Action was a big one. Communication was another one. Um, really great. And um, reaction was another thing, I think, and learned. These are great. Okay. So my, our definition of behavior that we're going to use for the rest of today is really similar and I think complements what a lot of you guys said. So <clears throat> anything that a person does that can be seen and counted, I really want to emphasize the word anything, anything a person does that can be seen and counted. Um, so that's really an expansive definition of behavior. It, you know, a lot of times when we think about behavior, we think about that negative stuff, that undesirable stuff, and that really takes over our definition. <clears throat> this shift to a, a positive focus is going to require us to expand that, really consider anything in the environment, anything that a person does that can be seen and counted, that's a behavior. And when we expand our definition of behavior, we're going to start to see a lot of other things in our environment. So I have a, a blank slide here, and I would like to fill this up with behaviors. You guys are doing a great job at the chat box. Go ahead and go back there and tell me, what are some behaviors? I just want to write all over this different behaviors. So sitting, great, smiling. And I'm just going to take them out of the chat box and put them up here for everybody to see. And when I spell them wrong, please don't judge me. <laughs> Playing. They're great. Keep them coming. I want to fill this up. How about three more? Thank you. Ask and you shall receive. Okay. Okay. It's a great list, guys. I am going to pick a new color. Oh, yelling. Thanks. I'm going to pick a new color. And I'm going to start circling things. And as I circle them, I want you to um, compare them to the uncircled things. What, what's different about the things that I circle? notice about the things that I'm circling? Okay. 
they're negative or undesirable. Wow, lots, you guys got it. It's just like a, a sea of negative now uh, popping up in the chat box. Exactly. So, you know, I want to encourage you that, um, you know, just a little bit more than half of um, of the behaviors that we shouted out were were negative. And the other half were some, were some uh, desirable behaviors. Um, so that's exciting. You guys are starting to expand that definition. I want to you to consider continually expanding, expanding. And, um, you know, as you, as you expand that, ideally we're identifying more and more of those just okay um, behaviors that, um, that are happening in the environment. So um, still happens that when we think about behavior, we often think about undesirable things. And as we move and shift to a more positive focus, we're going to expand our definition and start thinking about and really looking for prioritizing, um, identifying desirable behaviors. Okay, I'm going to pick a new color now, and I am going to uh, circle some more things. And as I circle them, I'd like you to consider again, what is different about what I am circling than the ones that I am not. Some of these are kind of hard. What do you notice about the ones I'm circling? Intentional, Sheila says. Okay, I think I've got them all. Not specific, Madeline says. Just gonna wait a second to see if anything else comes through. Otherwise, I think, honestly, Madeline, you really hit the nail on the head right there. So they're not specific, you know? And, and I kind of went back and forth about a couple of them, like interrupting. I was like, is that, that's like kind of specific, but not really, because think all the ways you could interrupt. You know, I, if, if you've been around a five-year-old, you've probably seen a lot of different ways that, that people can interrupt. Um, so uh, interrupting looks different based on the context of the environment. Um, it could look like, you know, pulling on the back of your sweater. It could also look like hopping in between two people talking. So many ways to interrupt. Uh, playing, playing what? You could be playing a gajillion things. It's just not very specific. I don't really know what's going on. Exercising, same thing. All the different ways you could exercise versus saying something like, um, use the treadmill for 30 minutes at 3.0 miles per hour. That's very specific and measurable. Um, so the other thing that we often do when we talk about behaviors is talk about them in big old categories. And one thing that really helps us start shifting to that focus of desirable behaviors and expanding our definition is thinking about the specific things that are occurring and avoiding the big old categories. Another reason that's really helpful is because it's difficult to see change over time when you're lumping a bunch of stuff together in a big old category. For example, let's say that um, yesterday um, I was interrupted by um, someone stepping in between me and um, shouting, um, I need you, I need you, I need you. And today they interrupted by pulling on my sleeve while standing next to me um, and quietly. They just kept pulling on my sleeve. Both of those things were interrupting. And if I was um, just thinking about them in that big old category, I wouldn't see the really vast improvement um, of the of the decrease in uh, the intensity of that interruption. The first time it was, I need you, I need you, I need you in my face. And the next day there was a real decrease in that behavior because um, it was just pulling on, on my um, sleeve. So when we talk about behavior, using those measurable, observable terms, using words of things you can see and count being done, um, then you're able to see that change in behavior over time. Um, and that's going to really help us to uh, to um, continue to see improvement and build upon that improvement. It's also going to make sure that everybody who might be in on the situation and supporting is, is on the same page about what behaviors are occurring. So we want to use measurable specific terms. We want to use specific actions and not those big old categories of interrupting or um, non-compliant, that kind of stuff. So here's an example. Um, instead of saying Kathleen is rude, someone could say Kathleen said, oh my God, uh, do you see what she is wearing so loud that that person heard them? 
So uh, now I know that in the future, I can look for Kathleen to reduce her, her behaviors by being quieter in her rude comments. That would be an improvement. Um, but if we just can say Kathleen is rude, then we're not going to see those changes in, in, um, in my behavior over time. Now, sometimes it is helpful to talk about a behavior in a big old category, and that's when um, you think about how you might respond. And so lumping those measurable specific behaviors into a category can be really helpful as we target behaviors for change. And so we have four categories here that we refer to continuously throughout the rest of this program. The first two are desirable types of behaviors, significant and just okay. So significant are those big deal things the quality of life improvers, the, the skills of daily living that help people's lives be better. Um, in the chat box, go ahead, tell me what would be a significant desirable behavior for you? Something that makes life better. It's a big thing. It's not happening all the time. It would be like, if you start doing that significant desirable behavior, it would be a huge life improver. What's an example of that? cooperation, um, do, following through on a task, following through on, a, on the task. That would be a significant desirable behavior. I could see that. Now for somebody who, um, you know, routinely uh, completes tasks, knocks all that stuff off their list, uh, you, uh, there that would be just an okay behavior maybe. One behavior I like to talk about um, when I talk about significant desirable behaviors is, is going to the gym. That would, exercising at the gym, using the treadmill, I'll be more specific. Um, you know, that would be significant desirable behavior for me. It's not something that's happening, uh, but it would be a great life improver. Um, completing their morning routine, Mel says. Um, doing each step in that morning routine. Eating um, healthy. So following like a, 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 the, a healthy diet, um, that would be a significant desirable behavior probably for most people. Some people, it's just okay. If you're just really into, you know, chickpeas, you, congratulations. Um, okay, so significant desirable behavior, those big deal things that we want to teach, model, increase, big deal quality of life improvers. And then there's the just okay stuff. This is the stuff that um, we're probably not really noticing happening. You know, I think shutting the door after you walk in the house is a good example. You know, it's kind of expected and, and it really only becomes a deal if you don't do it. So the just okay stuff, um, what might be some examples of some just okay behaviors? The stuff we kind of expect um, and people are pretty, pretty good at doing, they're, you know, just okay. If I used my exercise example, um, you know, if you are uh, Michael Phelps, exercising is just okay behavior. You do it all the time. Uh, he, he doesn't need a bunch of attaboys, but he needs one every once in a while. Uh, Maslin says saying please and thank you. Exactly. That's a just okay behavior. That's a good example too of like, you know, it's it really only uh, gets a, a, the, a response, a reinforcer when it, when it doesn't happen, then it gets a response. Um, okay, so the just okay behaviors. Uh, then there's the undesirable. And I want to talk about serious first, because I think it's easier to consider junk after you know what serious is. So serious are things that are physically harmful, physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. Those are things um, that we want to intervene, we want to um, uh, stop from happening. Um, and we're going to talk about a skill called stay close hat that's really useful um, in with serious behavior. And then there's the annoying junk, and that's also... Uh, undesirable, and it's the undesirable stuff that's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, but is really unhelpful. It is probably socially unacceptable. It may have at one point been age-typical behavior, and they never learned the other thing to do. They're just still doing it. Um, this is the stuff we spend a lot of time on. Um, it's very distracting. Again, it's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or legal, but it's definitely socially harmful. Um, put some barriers around the person for, you know, friendship um, and doing some of those more significant and just okay desirable behaviors. So, um, so continuing that, let's continue that exercise example. So, um, you know, if the person who goes to the gym uh, just to like stare and leer at people or hit on people, that's junk. 
It's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or legal, but it's gross. It's not going to help them make any friends, um, and nobody likes it. Super distracting. Um, and then exercising serious. If you are injured uh, and you need to rest, um, that would be serious behavior to go to the gym and exercise. You, it, is it could be physically harmful to you to exercise at that point. So we took that same behavior, and based on the environment, Based on the context, the person, their skill set, it really depends um, where that behavior might go, what category that might go to. So let's review this one more time, these categories. Uh, significant, desirable, those big deal quality of life improvers, these are the things we really want to spend our time teaching, modeling, and paying off big time. Uh, just okay behaviors. Um, these, again, we're probably not noticing a lot of these. They're just the typical stuff that's happening in the environment. And I want to submit for consideration that these are your opportunity. These are our opportunity to infuse an environment with additional positive feedback, with, a, with, a, with relationship building opportunities. Um, these just okay behaviors are a big cue that we need to start looking for and jumping on and utilizing. So this is this just okay is the opportunity. And then there's the junk. And this is where we're spending a lot of our time. Um, and we're really probably using a lot of those skills we talked about earlier, where we're trying to stamp out or just stop that behavior. It's annoying and it's driving us nuts and we just want it to stop. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about a skill called pivot that can help make that this kind of uh, behavior, this junk behavior happen less often, make it less likely to happen in the future. So we're gonna talk about that pivot skill here in a little while. So again, our definition are things that are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or legal, but they're annoying, they are not helpful, um, and they're really holding people back. And uh, let's talk about some we've seen. I think there might have been some on our list earlier. What are some junk behaviors? What are some junk behaviors? Let's go some examples. Uh, you know, cursing on here. We could probably just find some on here. There's some junk behaviors on here. Rolling eyes, Sheila says, is a perfect example. Whining, Maslin says, constantly talking, yes. Pouting, yep. These are great examples. They're not physically harmful, but they're definitely annoying. They're probably getting a reaction these days. Um, they're definitely not helping the person, you know, move on or do great things either. Flipping your hair. You're going to see some of that here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> fake burping. Um, great examples. Those are great examples of junk behavior. When you think about those junk behaviors, um, following people around, that's a great one. So, when you think about these behaviors, um, the, these junk behaviors specifically, what do people get out of them? Why do you think that they're doing them? Why are people flipping their hair, fake burping or pouting or whining or constantly talking? These are just such great examples, guys. What, what are people getting out of it? Why are they doing it? Attention, Natalie says. Oh, and, and Carol says, Stephanie says, yeah, there's a, all at once. Attention habits, Beth says. <laughs> be an anxiety thing jealousy sensory needs diverting these are great guys you know one thing that i that i am seeing in these is a lot of empathy for why a person might be doing this you know they want attention that's pretty understandable um um they're avoiding something they don't like i think we all do that right <laughs> um so I see a lot of empathy in there and in here, and I think that's important because as we shift away from trying to provide a different uh, response to junk behavior, the pivot that I mentioned earlier, it's really important to think about why a person's doing it, and that can help um, motivate us to provide that different uh, response. And in, in doing that, we can make that behavior happen less often. So let's think: what behavior is not 
junk. We talked about serious behavior and things that are not that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, and we should intervene. And so here's some examples on the screen. You know, someone's getting hit, um, throw, throwing a somebody throws a chair, they're banging their head with force. Like people can get hurt, and we need to intervene. So a couple of things we can do is one, plan ahead. We can have a safety crisis plan, and if you take your phone and the camera and hover over this uh, QR code here, uh, it'll take you to um, some information about safety crisis planning. And um, I'm going to put that, put the link in the chat box as well. So have a plan. Come up with a safety crisis plan and be prepared for those times if um, that someone might need some additional help. We're also going to talk about a stay close hot skill, which is really helpful as well. The other thing that we can do if um, our safety crisis plan is not effective and we're still needing help, someone is still in crisis, we can um, we can use this 988 um, to get some support. So this is for behavioral health crisis. And again, you can scan this QR code and get some more information about 988 and how it can help people who are experiencing behavioral health crises. So, one more time, just let's look at some of these significant desirable behaviors, mixing in ingredients for a cake. That's such a great significant desirable behavior for lots of people. For others, that might be just okay. Uh, reading a book, writing a letter, avoiding coercion when threatened, that's a significant desirable behavior for everyone. Uh, just okay, things like answering a question, saying thank you. Um, serious, again, things that are physically harmful, like getting hit or illegal, like taking your clothes off in public. Uh, annoying things would be cursing, spitting, burping, threatening. And again, you know, depending on the context of the environment, that could end up in a different place. For example, if you spit on a cop or if you spit on a bus driver, that's illegal. Then it's serious behavior. Okay, so based on the context of the environment, the person, uh, what's happening, Behavior um, can be categorized into these, and when we do that, it can help us determine what response might be best. Okay, the other foundational component of the strategies that we're going to share are these fundamental facts of behavior. So, the first one being the environment is responsible for the behavior. So that environment includes a person's history. It includes their physiology, how they're feeling right now. It includes their past experiences. And uh, what we know is that the, the, the behavior's right. So, and I don't mean it's right, like it was the right thing for Sally to yell or at someone or curse them out or whatever. I mean, it was the right behavior as in, it's what they knew to do in the moment to meet their needs. So given their history, given the environment that they're in, it's the behavior that should occur because that's what they knew to do. And we can change that behavior by changing the environment, by looking at the consequences and, and shifting the things in that situation to be different. So the environment is responsible for, for the behavior. And we can make changes in the environment that make it more likely desirable behavior occurs and less likely for the undesirable behavior to occur. We need to consider consequences as we're going through this. So, uh, you know, a consequence and get kind of like the definition, expanding the definition of behavior. Let's expand our definition of consequences. A consequence is anything that happens after the behavior. A consequence is not just a negative thing thrown at someone. It is anything that happens after a behavior. Um, so that consequence, a consequence can either strengthen a behavior and make it happen more often in the future or with greater intensity. Or it can weaken the behavior and make it make it less likely to occur in the future or with less intensity in the future. The only way we know is by what happens in the future. If that behavior continues to happen or happens more, then whatever's happening, whatever that consequence is, the thing that's happening after the behavior is strengthening it and making it stronger. If we're not seeing that behavior in the future, then whatever's happening afterwards, whatever consequence is occurring is weakening the behavior. So the only way to know if a consequence is um, reinforcing or strengthening a behavior, or if it's weakening or punishing a behavior is by that behavior in the future. What happens? Does it happen more? You're reinforcing or strengthening it. Is that behavior happening less? You're weakening or punishing it. 
it takes time. This one's really hard. It just takes time. You know, people have um, experienced an environment for a period for a long period of time. Making changes in that environment takes time. The consistency takes time. Um, so being patient and consistent, tweaking small things. Um, those are things that we want to look at. Time is important um, and that can make this this definitely hard. So um, patience and consistency. It's also important to consider uh, what happened in the past. The, uh, the way a person responded in the past, their past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So we can remember how things went previously. We can make a mental note. We can know we need to do things differently. We can anticipate uh, problems before they come and prevent them. And, and when we do that, we're going to see more success. We're going to shift things um, positively. Giving negative, coercive, punishing consequences, creating a worsening for people is bad for our relationships, makes people's lives worse, and it's really causing more problems. Um, in, in that it's motivating undesirable behavior um, and, and hurting our relationships. So we're going to avoid providing punitive uh, uh, consequences. We want to avoid coercion and we want to avoid that negative stuff. It is causing more problems in the long run, motivating that undesirable behavior. In the long run, Behavior responds better to positive consequences. So shifting our focus to positive, expanding our definition of behavior, really looking for opportunities to provide positive consequences is going to get us more desirable behavior to change in the long run. So again, this is this is a universal approach. These are things everybody needs for a high quality of life. This is not about fixing people. It is about creating a foundation for all other interventions. It's about increasing the quality of life. So in order to uh, change behavior, we need to teach, find, and pay more attention to desirable behavior. Doing desirable behavior has to pay off. It has to um, get people what they need. It has to, uh, um, it has to pay off. It has to get reinforced. It has to get noticed. Those are the things that get attention. So one way to um, start making changes, start moving towards positive behavior change is by um, identifying some targets. So when, I, when we think about target behaviors, we think about things that we want to teach, we want to model, <coughs> and we want to increase happening in the environment. So we're going to teach desirable behaviors, and we're going to, we're going to, uh, really focus on those to be providing desirable consequences after they occur. And that's going to strengthen and increase those. And then we also can work on identifying some things we want people to do instead and consider those as replacement behaviors um, and use those replacement behaviors as a, weak, a way to weaken undesirable behaviors, make them happen less often in the future because we're teaching and modeling and motivating those desirable replacement behaviors. So continuing down this des motivating desirable behavior, we have to start putting more attention. We have to start um, enhancing um, and, and emphasizing the desirable be healthy behaviors that are happening in the environment. And when undesirable behavior happens, we really want to minimize our response. We want to avoid that emotional response. We want to uh, be calm, non-emotional and just minimize any reaction we have to undesirable behaviors. Um, and then we want to teach the stuff that needs to happen instead. And when we see desirable behaviors, we really need to pay them off and associate them with big improvements in a person's life. You know, what does it mean for the person that they're able to do that now and really connect undesirable behaviors to bigger things that are possible, big improvements. So we're going to focus on desirable, healthy behaviors that we want people to do, and that's where we're going to spend our time. And when those are not the things that are happening, when undesirable or inappropriate behavior is going on, we're going to minimize our response and we're really going to avoid trying to focus on that undesirable behavior. That This is all about changing our focus. So we're all sitting here thinking about an important relationship to us and how making some changes in our uh, interactions can improve those relationships. And it's all about shifting our focus. 
in our interactions. Um, and again, remembering that it takes time. It takes time for us to change. It takes time for the environment to change. Um, and so really we're looking for improvement, not perfection. And I, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier when we talked about um, avoiding uh, those big old categories of behavior and talking about behavior in measurable specific terms. It's really going to help us in looking for improvement over time. Um, it's not that someone has to totally stop uh, interrupting it's that that interruptions become less and less intense in their in their um, and then hopefully they stop interrupting at some point uh, but it's really about the improvement and not just total perfection so it really takes patience um, okay the next thing we're going to talk about is coercion we said earlier that we're going to talk about some things that we want to avoid we're going to we're going to share 10 common coercions we're going to share the effects of coercion um and talk about why we uh we suggest that you avoid these so um here's a, a good definition um it's a person delivered punishment coercion is a person delivered punishment um, so it's creating a worsening for a person. There's some examples here, threats, humiliation, uh, you know, put down. Um, and, and when we think about discipline and teaching, we really need to think about um, avoiding coercion and not having systems of teaching or discipline that are based around um, coercion. It's a way that we punish people. It's a way we tell people, I don't like what you're doing uh, or you need to stop. Um, and we're all coercive. I, I um, we're going to share ten examples here in a minute. I just, I just want to throw out we're we're all coercive. Um, it's the way that our society operates. It's the way we've been uh, taught. Um, so, the the problem with socially mediated punishments or coercion is that. You're, you're the giver, you're imposing, you're the authority. It's not the natural result of the behavior. Um, and so it really comes down to damaging the relationship between the person. Um, as, you're, as you're doing that, you're delivering a worsening or, or coercion or, or trying to punish. Um, and it just erodes your relationships and makes the person want to avoid, escape, or get even. Um, so, you know, it's important that we know that these are not uh, planned reactions. These are habitual. They're things that have been modeled for us. Um, so I just want to give a lot of empathy to, uh, you know, when you see this list of coercions, you're going to be like, oh, that is me. I am doing that. We're all going to feel that because this is the way that we've been trained. It's the way that things happen in our society. So it's a big shift. Uh, you know, and trying to teach people by punishing them is, again, it's just going to hurt your relationship. Um, and it's also important to consider that when you're doing that, we're not teaching the behavior that we want when we're using punishment or coercion. You know, um, discipline, if, if we're providing punishment as discipline, um, we're really just motivating exactly what we don't want. Math is a discipline. Science is a discipline. English is a discipline. A discipline is something that's taught and something that's learned. And so if you're using punishment as a discipline, you're modeling and teaching and motivating exactly the behaviors that you don't want. So we really want to avoid um, using discipline, using practices of teaching that are um, that are coercive um, and, and trying to use punishment as a way to teach people. It is just going to damage our relationships. So again, I'm going to show you 10 examples of coercion. You're going to see yourself in them. And the first step is to just really start to identify when you're doing it. Um, you know, uh, identify what's going on. Um, just really want to reiterate that these are habitual reactions. They are not planned responses. We live in, an, in a coercive society and we've been taught and modeled and motivated across many environments to use coercion as a response to undesirable behavior. So our goal now is to, to become aware of our own coercion, our responses when we are experiencing coercion from other people, and look for alternative ways to respond. And I'm going to share one of those ways to, with you today, which was which is pivot. Okay, here's the examples of common things we're all doing. Questioning, 
arguing, sarcasm and teasing, verbal force, threaten, threats or threatening people, criticism, despair, oh, woe is me, lecture and logic, taking things away, taking away attention, just taking away in general, uh, and talking about people in front of them, talking about people's bad behavior in front of them. Let's go ahead and look at the chat box. I'm going to go into each of these a little bit deeper. Um, what are some of these common things that you've seen or of, of these examples I've given you? Um, what are some, what are the ones that are common that you've seen? I want to throw out the despair is my personal coercion and I can sigh that will tell you that I did not like that. It is That is what I work on most is, is keeping my sigh in. Oh, okay, these are great. Okay, um, Stephanie says questioning, yes. And, and Sheila says lecturing. So as we go through this and we start thinking about what these really look like, I want you to consider um, how this is looking and if you can connect with that. So Kathy says taking away. We all have one that is our um, uh, our thing, arguing, Maslin says, or just in despair. I think we're aligned there. Sarcasm, nitpicking, Lisa says. So if I was going to categorize that, I might think criticism maybe, um, you know, pointing out things, uh, taking away, being critical, Lisa says that criticism, that makes sense, Lisa. You described two different ways of being, of providing criticism. Um, questioning, sarcasm, being critical. Great. Okay. Let's talk about these examples. Questioning. So when you ask a question that you don't want answered, this is a big one that I think about how um, the way that you say it says so much too, you know? Uh, so do you know what time it is? I do you know what time it is? I asked the exact same question, but I, my body language and tone of voice on facial expressions said so many different things. The first one, I think I legitimately wanted to know that it's 1016. In the second example, I wanted you to know that I am not happy. My face said a lot of me not being happy. Um, and you're probably late, I think is what Everyone interpreted uh, my questioning uh, kind of coercion of, of you're late. So this is a great example of, um, you know, our body language says more than we think it does. Um, and we really need to be mindful about that. And um, again, it's not planned. Um, somebody showed up late, probably affected me in some kind of way. And, uh, you know, do you know what time it is? Really is a way to say, uh, you know, I, I'm upset things are late. Uh, this caused me a problem. It's just really unhelpful for my relationship to convey that message in that way. And it's it's not going to make the person more likely to be on time next time. Um, okay, arguing. The back and forth. Uh, trying to convince someone of your point of view um, or, or challenging their point of view in a co like co confrontational kind of way, you know, really ramps things up. Uh, you know, people just going back and forth, trying to convince each other, uh, share facts. It can really uh, get towards the lecture and logic, uh, other form of sorry of coercion that we mentioned. Um, and you know, it's really just bad for your relationship. And nobody's going to convince anybody anything. Um, we're probably using a lot of body language that's hurtful uh, when we're arguing, and you're you're just never going to convince Uncle Bud of your point. So, um, you know, you're really just hurting your relationship and keeping that argument going, that back and forth going. The next one is sarcasm and teasing. So, again, um, I this one has a lot to do with body language and tone of voice that says so much. Um, and And so when you use sarcasm, it's really the idea that you're saying the opposite of what you mean. Or teasing is a way of uh, pointing something out um, about a person or about a situation. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but it's really at someone's expense, like whatever you're pointing out is uh, probably not the most positive thing. Uh, so sarcasm and teasing are bad for your relationship. They're also just really complex social skills. <clears throat> and so you're really modeling a behavior that is unlikely to be able to be recreated or be able to make you friends. It's just very nuanced. Not everyone understands sarcasm and teasing. And really, again, they're at someone's expense. There's there's someone 
uh, that's the butt of that joke or that um, saying the opposite of what you mean. Force. Uh, so this could be verbal or physical. Obviously, physical force is abuse and um, you want to avoid that. And then, you know, verbal force would be like, like loud and close, like the, the, there's like an intensity to it. Um, so that's a form of coercion we'd certainly want to avoid. Definitely creates a worsening for people um, and, and, and hurts. Definitely bad for your relationship. Threats. So pointing out the bad event that will happen if a person continues doing X, Y, or Z. You know, um, if you don't get in the car on time, I'm going to make you listen to talk radio. Or, um, you know, if, if you don't get your homework done, you're not going to the mall. Um, if you don't stop, you're going to time out. If you don't eat dinner, you're not getting your dessert. You know, all the things that can happen if you don't do the thing you're supposed to do. <clears throat> so pointing out um, someone's engaging in undesirable behavior, you point out that if they continue that, there's something they're not going to get. You're making a threat. Definitely a worsening, a put down for the person. Um, and really, um, like, you're not always even guaranteed to, like, follow through on that. So... Um, we're really making the situation worse for everybody when we use a threat, including the person who gave the threat. Criticism. Um, so telling a person how they could do something better, or that you don't like the way that they're doing it. You know, um, it's really, if, if somebody's already started a task and you have a way they could do it better, great. Save it. Let them finish the task and before they have the opportunity to do it again. Sounds like you should have a teaching interaction and show them how they might be able to, to do that more quickly or, you know, with a better quality. Uh, but after they've already started, uh, it's going to be seen as criticism if you start telling them how they could do it better. Um, again, body language, tone of voice says a lot here. <clears throat> um, criticism. Despair. I already said this is mine. I appreciate people ratting themselves out about what their coercion is. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> say it, it, uh, you appear as though you're helpless, you're giving up, you don't know what to do. <sighs> you sigh, you roll your eyes. There's lots of um, <clears throat> exasperation throwing your hands up. Uh, it really can send two, two potential messages. Um, it, it may make the person feel more hopeless, which isn't going to make them more likely to engage in a desirable behavior or get on the right track. Um, and it also might be satisfying um, that they got back or at, got back at you or, um, or, you know, made you unhappy in some kind of way. It's not motivating the, the person to do better. And it gives the message that, um, that you've given up, which isn't going to make anything in the environment, uh, isn't going to improve anything in the environment if, if we give up. Lecture and logic. This is the Charlie Brown, your teacher, you're talking too much, getting tuned out, um, telling a person something they already know, talking too much. I At this point in the training, you haven't got to talk for, you know, 10 minutes, and I'm starting to sound uh, like logic and lecture. Um, especially because I'm talking about a bunch of things we're all doing, right? So um, <clears throat> so talking too much, um, telling a person things they already know or repeating things like that, it's le lecture and logic. Um, if you have something that you want to teach them, uh, pick another moment um, <clears throat> to do that. Taking away. So, uh, you know, these are things that you're probably thinking about, you know, taking away an iPad or toys or, you know, uh, that trip to the mall or whatever. Um, you know, I, I would submit for consideration as well as those like items or privileges being taken away. But, you know, like time out, for example, is taking away the opportunity for attention. Um, so that's also coercive. So taking away, limiting access is one way that we tell people that we don't like what they're doing. Um, and we're really damaging our relationship. And the last one here is talking about a person's bad behavior in front of them. Super embarrassing. Um, definitely happens, you know, if you support someone at the doctor's office or something like that. Um, you know, there's just lots of opportunities where we're talking about people in front of them. Do you know what your kid did today? That kind of thing. Um, so best practice is to avoid having conversations about people in front of them. Um, <clears throat> really 
just hurtful and damaging to our relationships. So those are the 10 examples of, co of common types of coercion that we're, that we're doing that are hurting our relationships. Um, and the common effects of coercion are here on the screen for you. So the big ones, we say it ages you. Avoid, get even, and escape. So avoid looks like something that happens uh, down the road. You know, if every time I um, go to family dinner, Uncle Bud and I get in an argument, I am going to struggle to want to go to family dinner all the time because I don't want to deal with Uncle Bud. We're always getting in this argument, right? You avoid people that you experience coercion from. So that's one uh, common effect. Another one is getting even. And so <clears throat> this looks like coercion meets coercion. And that's really what happens, right? So if um, you feel like you're getting uh, criticized, you know, somebody's telling you how you could do something better and you're, you know, really working at it and they're just telling you, you know, all the things you need to do differently and better, you're going to, you could potentially, you know, yell or use some of that verbal force or, uh, you know, start an argument about why your way is the best or, you know, coercion meets coercion. So if we're coming at people um, with that, you know, really focused on that undesirable behavior, there is the tendency to go to coercion and you're just getting back and forth and getting even with each other. Really can ramp up a situation. Another common effect of coercion is escape. And that's just, I'm getting coerced. I've got to get out of here. I cannot deal with this anymore and just trying to completely get out of the situation. So again, people wanting to avoid you, get even with you or escape you is not a great relationship. Um, <clears throat> and avoiding coercion can help improve your relationship because we're not motivating those things that are really hurting us. The other things that can happen when we use coercion are that people learn coercive behavior. That's how we all learned it. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's modeled in the environment. It's, we see it all the time. Um, and so we're teaching people to be coercive when we're when we're using that. The other thing that happens is that it, people behave less confidently. They're not sure what to do. Um, you know, experiencing coercion. <clears throat> uh, you you know you want to avoid it, um, and so people are just trying to 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 get by. That's not a, a place where people feel confident. I I really like the example of um, of uh, Seinfeld. And there's an episode of Seinfeld, the soup Nazi, and Seinfeld loves this soup. And uh, the owner of the restaurant is is widely known as a difficult person. And if you step out of line, you're just kicked out of the restaurant. And he said, no soup for you. Seinfeld, this man who can get up in front of thousands of people on a stage. I mean, that's like incredible confidence, right? Like you could get up and, and uh, you know, entertain this, this giant group of people. He, he has this skill. But you see him in this restaurant desperately wanting this delicious soup and he's scared. He doesn't want to step out of line. Th that environment is so coercive that he's just standing there cowering with his head down, holding his tray like, okay, I'm, I'm almost there. I almost got my soup. Um, so people who are experiencing coercion, people who are existing in a coercive environment behave less confidently. They also receive attention for undesirable behavior. These examples of coercion don't generally just come out of nowhere. They're responses to undesirable behavior at the environment, and they're common ways that we try to stamp it out or get rid of it. And so if this is the kind of way that we're trying to deal with undesirable behavior, we're really focused on undesirable behavior, and we're providing a lot of attention for it. And attention was one of the things y'all put in the chat box about common reasons people are doing that junk behavior. So if we're using these forms of coercion or, or and responding to those undesirable behaviors that we already said are being motivated by attention, we're really continuing to motivate it and we're unlikely to, to get any kind of change. So we're really, people are really receiving a lot of attention for undesirable behavior. And, and typically it's with one of these forms of coercion. So let's think about when we're coercive. I said that the goal here, we're all gonna see ourselves in the coercion. Um, and the goal here is really to start becoming aware and identifying some things that we could do differently to avoid using this coercion. And so it's helpful to think about, you know, when are you typically coercive? Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So when are we typically coercive? Uh, when you're hangry, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, uncomfortable, you're wearing itchy clothes, you know, what's going on? Um, you're frustrated, overexcited, you know, anxious. Um, you encounter your pet peeves, you walk in the house and every cabinet in the house is open. Um, you're used to using them. 
because of your own past experiences. These are all reasons that were typically coercive that we can plan for um, and help identify some different things that we could do instead, like pivot. So it's it's good to remember coercion. There's a reason we use coercion. It's because it works in the moment it works. And so that's really reinforcing to our brain and makes it so that we're like, okay, I'm going to do that again next time. It's, it's really a trick. Coercion produces short-term compliance, but long-term problems. It does not make that undesirable behavior less likely to happen in the future. It really only damages our relationship. It might make that behavior stop in the moment, might get you that short-term compliance, but it's going to be followed by long-term problems. It's not going to make that behavior less likely to happen in the future. So if we're not going to use coercion, what can we do? We can uh, make a plan. We can think about um, things that are happening in the environment. We can think about what happened that triggered the undesirable behavior. So what was going on before the undesirable behavior happened? Um, can I look at that trigger and see if we can remove it so it, it doesn't happen again, so it's, or it's, it's less likely to, to happen in the environment. I could also consider what the person's getting out of that um, undesirable behavior. We considered that earlier. And one of the, the things you said people were getting out of undesirable behavior was attention. So if the payoff is attention, I can think, am I doing that? Am I providing that payoff that they're looking for? What's the payoff they're looking for? Start to think about that. I can also think about if if there are times when the person is successful, they they experience that trigger, but they engage in a desirable behavior. What happens? What happened when they did the desirable behavior? Did it get that big reaction that it needed? Did it get paid off? Um, can we beef up our consequences when they do that desirable behavior? Uh, we can also consider what does the person need to learn to do? I mentioned earlier that a lot of the junk behaviors that we deal with are we're at one point age appropriate and a person didn't learn the skill to replace that. So let's consider what do we want the person to do instead? What do they need to learn to do? And we can teach that. We can also make changes in the environment that make undesirable behavior less likely to happen. Again, removing some of those triggers, trying to figure out what can prompt people to do the desirable behaviors. What can we put in the environment to make those desirable behaviors stand out and cue people to do them? The other thing we can do is build a relationship. And this is the part where we're gonna start talking about some real skills that we can start using. So, so far we've covered how do we think about behavior? Let's get on the same page about what we mean. Behavior is anything a person does. When we talk about people's behavior, we're gonna use measurable specific terms. We want everybody to know what we're doing and we really want to remove the guesswork out of those big old categories. The way we're going to use categories is by identifying based on the context of the environment, this specific action a person engaged in would go in one of these four categories, significant, desirable, things that improve your life and make them better, uh, um, just okay, things that we just kind of expect in an environment and really are our opportunities to build a relationship. Um, we learned that there's two types of undesirable behaviors, This the uh, serious things that are physically harmful to themselves, others' property or illegal, and the junk, the things that we're spending a lot of time doing. We also talked about some 10 common things that we're doing that are not helpful. So we're gonna avoid those. And now let's talk about some proactive things that we can do. So we're gonna avoid coercion and we're gonna replace that behavior for ourselves with using these skills. The first one is stay close. This is a great relationship building tool. Uh, starts with moving towards the person. It's pretty difficult to have a meaningful conversation from across the room. So we wanna to move towards the person. Great demonstration of caring, interest. Uh, the next step is that we touch if appropriate. So, you know, you could walk up to a person, a pat on the back, you know, whatever's appropriate, a handshake, fist bump. Uh, I'm gonna lump numbers three and four here together. So uh, we're gonna be mindful of our body language, tone of voice, uh, facial expressions, all of that nonverbal, uh, communication is seeing so much more than the words coming out of our mouth. So we're going to be really mindful that our face says that we're interested, that our body language is leaning towards, the, you know, that we're showing interest with our body language and our tone of voice. Um, you know, I could facilitate this same content 
with a tone of voice that is monotone and does not uh, enhance or accent the things that are important. Um, and people will not get the same thing out of it. You will not hear me, you'll tune me out. Um, it's not the same. So be really mindful of your body language. You're saying so much more with that than the words coming out of your mouth. The next three, we, and we're going to lump is OEE. -E. It's a great little thing for your head. As you start interacting with people in this manner, you can remember OEE. -E. And in your interactions, check that, that list off. I did an open-ended question. Okay, check it off. I did an empathy. Check it off. I did an encouragement statement. So an open-ended question, the, the intent and goal of an open-ended question is to keep the conversation going. It's to learn more. It's a really great way to show that you're interested. And the goal is to ask, again, ask questions in order to keep the conversation going um, and respond to when, when you get the answer to your question, respond with empathy. That's a great way to show that you understood what was being shared with you um, and connecting it back to that person. So an empathy statement looks like identifying the emotion a person is feeling and naming it. It's not a question. It's a statement. I'm not going to ask you how uh, if you're feeling good today. I'm going to say, you look pretty chipper. What's up? Uh, you know, I am going to name the thing I see. That tells the person I understand them. That's a connection between the two of us. I get you. I feel you. So, so using an empathy statement, using a really high quality emotion word, uh, tells the person that you see them, that you understand how they feel and that you relate to them. You're a good person to talk to. The next one is, is encouragement. And this looks like uh, acknowledging something the person is doing now that's good for them to continue. Tell them what it means for the future. Um, you know, uh, you're, somebody's focused on um, a puzzle and they get that done and the encouragement could be something like, man, you just did a 48 piece puzzle. I bet, I bet next time you can do 60. Or, you know, what does it mean for them in the future that they've been able to do this skill? You're going to listen when the person is talking. Again, this is all about relationship building. Um, you want to avoid talking more than the person. Be sure that you're talking less. Don't change the subject or interrupt them. This is your opportunity to build your relationship and show that you care. So really focusing on open-ended questions, empathy, encouragement, be mindful of your body language. Um, and, uh, and these last two steps here are important, and I'm going to lump them together as well. Avoid coercion. Don't react to junk behavior. And, and they go hand in hand because that reaction to junk behavior, again, is, is typically some kind of coercion. So um, we're going to talk about pivot uh, here soon. And you can do that if you're experiencing a lot of junk behavior. So empathy, big step here. Being able to tell, take the perspective of another person, tell them the emotion that you see, um, tell them that you see them, that you see how they're feeling. So, and then encouragement. Uh, again, connecting this thing they're doing now to what it could mean for them in the future. Let's practice these two skills of, of empathy and encouragement. Go to the chat box. I'm going to tell you about awesome Alex. Alex just passed his GED. Big deal. He studied four hours. You were there. You saw him. He worked so hard to prepare for this. Y'all are walking down the hall and he uh, rushes over to show you that he has got this. Look what I got. What's your empathy statement? What can you tell Alex? How does Alex feel? How can you show him that you understand what he's feeling? You see him. What's your empathy statement? Awesome, Alex. Passed his GED. Outstanding, Kathy. You must be so proud. You worked so hard. High five. There you go. Um, I see the hard work you put into it. Carol's going to really use her body language and get excited with him. Show him. It looks like smiles. Uh, maybe a whoop. Uh, some hands up in the air. Um, I know that was hard work. Congrats. I like the effort that that's part of that empathy is like, um, you know, the emotion or, or really acknowledgement of the effort and how they must feel about having done all of that. I love it. Awesome. 
also, uh, I want to go back real quick to, um, I want to remember who it was here. Kathy said, you must be so proud. I love the way that Kathy phrased that. A lot of times when we use proud, we say, I'm proud of you. But Kathy did a great job of, again, it's about how the person feels. And so acknowledging that they are proud of themselves is what we're going for with this empathy. Okay. Now we're going to encourage Alex. What does it mean for him? He studied so hard for hours preparing for this GED. He passed. That's great. What does it mean for, for him that he was able to work so hard to accomplish a goal? What encouragement can we provide him? What encouragement can we provide him? That's a, that's a great empathy, Taylor. You worked so hard for it. What's it, what's an encouragement? What does it mean that he was able to work so hard to prepare for something and he was successful? What can he do in the future? Because he he's demonstrated that he can prepare, that he can work hard. What does that mean for him in the future? The confidence. In, you mastered this. Confident. What does that mean? What could you tell him? You know, you worked so hard preparing for this. I am sure that's going to look so good on your resume. Really help you get a job. What does that mean? What can you tell him that it means for him? Connect it to big things. You can do hard things. You can do hard things. There you go. Um, how hard you worked for this. You've shown yourself that you can do anything you put your mind to. Think of the opportunities that are open to you now. Yep. And if you know that Alex is really interested in a particular opportunity, like, you know, he's been really wanting that job at, at um, the amusement park or whatever, uh, name it <coughs> way to persevere that's good um, empathy too and then uh that's a good uh question uh to keep that conversation going you know what are you gonna tackle next encouraging to keep moving so um when you encourage you're looking at things that are happening right now that you that they could continue to do so it's really building upon this work that they've already done we're not going to give them more work to do we're going to identify the work that's happened and what it means for them in the future these good things that can happen okay let's take another one we're going to talk about coworker carl now again we want to use just okay times, just regular, normal times to improve and build our relationship. And so we want to improve our relationship with coworker Carl. We're going to have a good stay close with him. So you're walking into the break room for lunch and Carl smiles at you and says hi. Um, and he even moves some papers for you to sit down. So um, what's an empathy and encouraging statement you could give Carl? These ones are harder, so you might have to make some things up. You know, maybe... Uh, you and Carl are working on a project together or, um, you know, he tells you he's had a great day. Acknowledge him, smile back and return the conversation. So great. Yeah. You, this is a good one that, you know, if Carl smiled and said, uh, move some paper so I could sit down, I'd probably start with an open-ended question. What's up with you today? And let's say Carl says, <coughs> oh, I'm just wrapping up that report. Let's say that. What can you, what kind of empathy can you give him about him wrapping up his report? Engaging him in conversation. Thank him for moving papers. Very polite. He tells you he's just wrapped up this report. What kind of empathy can you give him? How might Carl feel after having accomplished right, finishing up his report? How might he feel? What kind of empathy emotion statement can you give him?
congratulate him on that. And we want to tell him and empathy is a statement. So, you know, Carl's smiling already. I think we could infer that he is feeling pretty, pretty good about having finished this report. Um, what a huge weight off your shoulders. That's great. Yeah. So you told him that you see how he feels, you know, relieved. He's got a weight off his shoulders. Relief is another one. That's great. Um, Lisa says she can tell that you're happy. That's great. Those are great empathy statements. Okay, so Carl finished this report. Um, he uh, welcomed you to sit down with him. What kind of encouragement can you give him? What does it mean for Carl that in the future that he has completed this report? He's relieved. What does it mean for him? What can you? What kind of encouragement can you provide him? Keep it up in what? Now that you're done with that. You're really proving yourself. Keep up those reports on. Yeah, that's great. You're going to earn that promotion, I'm sure. You know, what does it mean that we've accomplished this task? That's the encouragement. Okay, let's talk about. So, so we're going to use. Backtrack for a sec. We're going to use. Uh, opportunities to build our relationship and and you're probably already you know doing that to some extent um, and so when you use this group of skills the stay close interaction here it's going to improve the value of your interaction you know you providing empathy and encouragement in, in, improves the increases the value of that interaction between the two of you and that can improve improve your relationship and we're also going to avoid coercion. And so we're going to have to come up with another thing to do. So avoiding uh, pivoting around and avoiding that junk behavior is going to be uh, what we want to do. And the first part of, of really thinking about making this change is, again, consider what the person's getting out of it. We talked about attention earlier. Um, you know, sometimes people do something to get you to comfort them or feel bad. Um, you know, that despair. <clears throat> Uh, maybe get a reaction, get even, um, uh, you know, coercion motivates coercion. Uh, they might use a junk behavior to get you to give in to them or delay something. Uh, just consider why people are doing it. Um, and I think that really motivates us to provide another response. So it's also important to remember that the majority of serious situations of really uh, undesirable behavior start with junk and just escalate as they get react as that junk gets reacted to. Um, you know, it might have started with um, a bit of criticism and it escalated into a full fledged fight, right? Um, so intervening at the junk part, intervening where we were providing coercion is going to make that serious behavior less likely to occur. So how do we pivot? How do we avoid reacting when we're met with undesirable behavior, when we're met with that junk? The first thing we're going to do is be mindful of our body language because we already said it's saying a lot more than we think it is. And it's saying a lot more than the words coming out of our mouth. So be mindful of your face, your body language, tone of voice. Yeah, check yourself first, Lisa says. We're going to avoid providing that response. And then we're going to think about what can we focus on instead. Instead, and So we call those our pivot options. And I have three here for you. So the first one <clears throat> is to pivot on another person. And I think that this works best when, you know, if you consider you're walking into a space and <coughs> you got multiple people, you got you got some people on task and you got somebody off task. Focus on the people who are on task. You know, if if Sally and Johnny are at a table and Sally's working hard and Johnny's over here, you know, looking at his pen and looking at the ceiling, focus on Sally. You know, learn about what Sally's working on. Um, and in in uh, out of the corner of your eye watch for uh, Johnny to pick up his pen or look at his paper and start to start to get a little more on task. And then you can shift to step three to pivot back. So one option, focus on the, the desirable behavior of another person in the environment. And notice um, I focused on Sally. I didn't say, Johnny, why can't you be more like Sally? It's not a comparison between people. Um, it's just 
a focus on the desirable things in the environment. So one option is if people in the environment are doing desirable things, focus on those people. Pivot to another person. Okay. The next option is to pivot on an activity. And I really want to make this point that this is my activity. We taught so we mentioned earlier that one of the common ways we try to stamp out behavior is redirection. That is not what I'm suggesting here. I am going to redirect myself to my own activity. Um, so focus yourself on an activity while out of the corner of your eye, you're attending, you're identifying when the undesirable behavior stops, and then you can pivot back uh, to that person. So focus on an activity of your own is one way to avoid reacting to that junk. And the last one here is to pivot on the person and just act as though the junk wasn't happening. You know, if you think about somebody swearing or picking their nose um, or, uh, you know, the, the junk behavior that you can just keep talking to them uh, as though those undesirable behaviors weren't happening, <clears throat> that's an, uh, a great way to pivot. And in that one, there's no pivot back. You just keep acting as though that undesirable behavior wasn't occurring. Um, we're going to repeat this as long as necessary. People have been engaging in junk behavior for a really long time. It's unlikely that one, one type of pivot or one round of pivoting is going to be enough um, to totally shift to, into desirable behavior. But again, this is about the long term. We're thinking about making the behavior less likely to happen in the future. Um, and so with that goal, um, you know, we can repeat, we can avoid coercion and stay cool. So let's. Uh, Think about how this is different. We talked about how it's different than redirection because I am engaging in the activity. I'm not trying to get them to do anything different. I am going to do something different. Um, so that's how it's different than redirection. And this is also different than ignoring um, <clears throat> because we're, it's really quite active to pivot. Um, I'm not reacting to this behavior, but I'm reacting to lots of other things in the environment. My focus is elsewhere in the environment. It's on the desirable things. It's a very active skill. Uh, and so problems with ignoring it that just pretending like it's not happening is that could be coercive. You're potentially ignoring a whole person. Um, <clears throat> it can also be super reinforcing, you know, exactly what they wanted was for you to ignore them. Um, and it can also cause a behavior burst. Oh, you don't see me doing this. You're ignoring this. Well, let me show you. Uh, and things get much, much worse um, <clears throat> because we have been ignoring. And so the shift to pivot um, can increase desirable behaviors because we're looking for desirable behaviors in the environment. We're looking for the for just okay behaviors of the person engaged in the junk. If you're pivoting on a person, or you're you're looking for desirable behaviors of your activity. If you're you're pivoting to your own activity, or you're looking for the desirable behaviors of other people and really spending time uh, focused on that the people who are um, doing those desirable behaviors, and that's the kind of stuff that gets attention in this environment. That will weaken the undesirable uh, behaviors because um, we're avoiding providing those consequences. Um, it can also prevent that behavior burst. So you didn't see this. Let me show you. Um, and again, it can prevent escalation to serious behavior because what we know is that episodes of serious behavior are often stemming from that junk behavior getting reacted to and ramping up, uh, ramping up into serious. Okay, let's practice some of these. So the first one here is is annoying Addie. Addie's over here picking her nose and telling me about a package that she got. And I'm in the middle of typing an email. And so I got Addie over here and I can see her and she's pretty excited. And I'm not going to ignore her. I'm going to focus on my typing and give her a couple of hums. So I am not ignoring. What am I looking for? I'm going to keep typing and giving a few random nods uh -huh, so I don't ignore, but what's my cue to pivot back? Go to the chat box. What's what's my cue to pivot back? What am I looking for out of the corner of my eye? What am I looking for? How will I know when it's the right time to pivot, pivot to Allie, to pivot back? What am I looking for? How will I know when it's the right time? <clears throat> it's 
assume you could talk out loud. What am I looking for from Addy? What am I looking for from Addy? I'm not reacting to the nose picking because I'm typing. <clears throat> I'm typing. And it, out of the corner of my eye, I'm waiting for what? For her to stop picking her nose. That's right. When when her hands move away from her face, uh, I <clears throat> will wait about 10 seconds. And then I am going to pivot back. Oh, that's so cool. You must be pumped about that package. How special. And now I'm really engaging with her, right? I've focused until she stops doing the undesirable junk. And then I'm going to turn uh, and really bring her into that. So the whole goal is to avoid reacting to that undesirable nose picking. <clears throat> How about Ollie? <clears throat> Ollie and, and, and Sally are at the table working on a project and <clears throat> Sally is humming and listening to her favorite song and Ollie is over here like, just so done. I'm just so done. I'm gonna tear those crap up. I'm done. So, uh, Sally is on task. Oliver is pretty clearly off task. Who do I start engaging? Tell me. Who do I start engaging? Focus on Sally. Shelley says that's right. That's exactly right. Um, great. Lisa says the same thing. Yeah, we're gonna focus on Sally. Um, Sally is on task, and I'm going to focus on her. Um, what am I looking for from Oliver? How will I know when it's time to pivot back to Oliver? How will I know when it's time to pivot back to Oliver? I'm focused on Sally. I'm learning about her project. Um, how will I know when it's time to pivot back to Oliver? When he settles down, okay? So if I were going to think about that in um, in some... Um, some measurable specific terms, what would it look like for Oliver to calm down or um, or settle down? How will I know when when that happens? What will it look like for Oliver? So he could stop muttering, okay? So when Oliver's quiet, that could be one cue. Maybe Oliver picks up his pen or looks at his paper, uh, starts working on his project again, Natalie says. That's right. So when Oliver demonstrates that he is uh, on task and some kind of, again, we're not looking for perfection, uh, but we're looking for improvement, he shifts his attention. Uh, <clears throat> exactly. So we're looking for Oliver to shift his attention, and that's when we're going to shift our attention back to him. So um, again, I just want to go right back to that slide for a moment. So when Oliver uh, um, starts engaging in that desirable behavior, he starts looking at his paper, or he starts working on that project again, or he just stops the, the really junky muttering, I'm going to uh, wait for about 10 seconds, and then I'm going to pivot to him just like um, after Addie takes her finger away from her nose for about 10 seconds, hopefully I can get 10 seconds of no finger in the nose, then that's going to be my cue to pivot back. And that timing is important because I want to put some distance between when that undesirable behavior occurred and when I responded, because again, I don't want it to appear as though I'm ignoring it or ignoring the person. Um, I want it to appear as though I was busy with other things, that I was focused on something else. Um, and, uh, again, it's a very active skill, uh, to attend to, to other desirable behavior in the environment. Okay. What else can we do? <clears throat> Stay close. That's a great skill for when, uh, things are ramping up for when someone had something happen to them that caused a worsening. Um, you know, I think there's lots of examples of, um, of times to use stay close hot. So for you guys in your environment, what's a worsening for a person? What could happen that we might need to use this stay close close hot skill? Someone perceives things got worse for them. Um, you know, you woke up this morning and learned it was a school day. Things got worse. It's a stay close hot. What's something in, in your environments or something that would be a stay close hot that you're going to consider? I could use this skill. Dogs got into the trash. Oh, man. Yes. Yes, it's a great example of a stay close hot. 
having to clean that up. Oosh. What are some other examples of a stay close hot? It's great these are hard to think of. Uh, sounds like you guys are really making that shift and trying to think about all the other times where things are just okay. <laughs> Oh, these are great. Sits down in the hall. Uh, teenagers giving you major attitude in public. That is a super close one. These are great. Okay. So things got worse for a person. And um, stay close hot stands for the skill that we would use when things go poorly, when things have gotten worse for a person. Uh, this is a skill that we would use to de-escalate. And so some examples of opportunities that we could use this skill um, folks put somebody sits down in the hallway, um, teenagers giving attitude in public, you walk in the house and the dogs have trashed everything. Um, being around somebody who's negatively, uh, who's responds negatively. Um, yeah, uh, throwing someone's throwing things. Those are great reasons to use this skill. Okay, so this is going to look pretty familiar because it's very similar to the to the relationship building skill that we talked about earlier. So the first step is to not react to the junk behavior. Uh, we're going to stay calm and caring and concerned, but we are not going to react to that junk behavior. Um, typically, we're going to move towards the person, uh, make sure that we're making considerations for safety, um, but typically we're going to move towards the person. We're going to touch if appropriate. Uh, it's a great way to show that you care. Uh, we're going to ask open-ended questions if we need to. Uh, remember, the goal of open-ended questions is to learn more information. So, you know, if um, if you're, uh, if the, like the teenager example in public, you might not want to ask a bunch of questions about what's going on because you already know um, and uh, you're not going to hear anything that's really particularly helpful. You also, when you consider open-ended questions, it is to keep the conversation going. So avoid asking questions that are going to lead to problem solving or something like that. That's not the goal of this. The goal is to learn more information. We really want to avoid trying to fix it. That really is probably going to turn into some kind of logic or a lecture if, if we try to fix it in this moment. So ask questions if you need to so that you can learn information and listen to the response. And if you don't have to ask questions, just listen to what's happening. Listen to what the person is saying. Talk less than them. Don't change the subject. Keep talking about this thing that's important to them. We're going to use empathy and say, this is your heartbroken. You're so upset. I can see the look on your face. You're just so disappointed. Uh, you know, really identify the emotions that are being expressed and name them. So, so important, um, especially in these difficult situations. I know that there's a common... Um, uh, the, the, that we don't often want to, that we're, that people are often worried that if they say you're so heartbroken, you're so disappointed that they might make things worse. But in fact, it makes things better for the person because they, they, they hear that you understand them, that you see them, that you see how the situation is affecting them or, or what their experience is. And that connection can make things better. Um, so name it, tell the person that you see how they're feeling and, and, um, and tell them, tell them, you see them, tell them, uh, name that emotion, they tell them how this situation is affecting them, that you see them, that connection will really help deescalate the situation. And then use encouragement, identify anything a person is doing that would be good for them to continue and say it, you know, even if the only thing that's happening that's desirable is that they're talking to you about it. That can be encouragement. You know, this situation is so difficult. You're already talking about it. If you know they've been through something like this before, there's encouragement. You know, uh, you know, oh, this is so hard. And I know you've been through this before. And you can, last time you, you know, did this. And I think you can do it again. I know you can get through this. You know, encourage uh, something desirable that they're doing right now. Tell them what it means for them in the future. 
uh, you know, you're already taking deep breaths. I see that. That's really something good to help calm, calm the situation. This is so difficult. Um, so really just empathy, encouragement for anything desirable that you can see. And that is going to help calm the situation, help de-escalate the situation. You're going to repeat these skills until a person demonstrates that they're calming down, that the that things are um, coming into control, and um, and and that can be a sign that they're ready for the next step. So repeat, repeat, repeat until the person is ready for the next step, and then direct to an alternative behavior. Maybe problem solving, but really maybe accessing that coping skill that could have helped them in the first place. You know, I see you're starting to feel a little bit better. I, I know that one thing that really helps um, when you're having a bad day is to take a walk. Do you think that that's something that we could do now? Um, and hopefully uh, they want to do that and maybe they say no. Go right back to the empathy. You're right. This is a difficult situation. I just, I know you're having a really hard time. It seems like you're really starting to, um, you're really handling this well. I know it's difficult. Um, so just go back to those earlier steps of empathy and encouragement. If if you try to direct and it doesn't go well, we just need to keep going back. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Open into questions, empathy, encouragement. That's a great way to de-escalate a situation. So again, empathy is identifying an emotion someone is feeling and naming it. It tells the person that you see how they're feeling, that you understand their point of view. You do not have to agree with the emotion in order to do this. You don't have to agree with the reason behind the emotion. You're just naming the emotion and seeing that you see how the person is feeling. That is a great connection and will help de-escalate. Let's practice these. I have two scenarios that we're going to practice. The first one is is sad Sammy. She called you um, and she or she texted you, pardon me, um, and she's like, oh, I'm so over this. I'm not going to take their crap anymore. She's told you about how her her and her roommate got in an argument. And you know that often Sam will lay in bed for just hours and cry. So this time she's laying in bed and she texts you, tells you about this fight, and she says, oh, I'm over this. I'm not going to take their crap anymore. What's an empathy statement that you can give to Sam? How is Sam feeling? How can you name that emotion? Tell her. What can you say to Sam? It's an empathy statement for Sam. This sounds frustrating. Great, great job. You named the emotion and you made a statement. You see how she's feeling. This sounds frustrating. <clears throat> You're hurting. Uh, it sounds like you're really frustrated. Yeah, frust I agree. Frustrated seems like a really good word for how Sam is feeling right now. I think you guys hit the nail on the head. Great. Okay, now encouragement. You know that S Sam will often lay in bed for hours crying when she's upset. She's texted you, though. Yes, she's laying in bed crying, but she's texted you. What kind of encouragement can we give Sam? She's been through this before. What kind of encouragement? What about this situation is good for Sam to continue? That will be helpful for her. What's an encouragement statement? That she reached out. Exactly. This is a, you're so frustrated and you reached out. It's great. Love it. Reaching out to someone in a, in a time of need is a great strategy. So you can encourage her that that's a thing that she could do. It's great. You can also say things like, man, you guys have been through this before. So it sounds really difficult. Um, you know, that you can get through this again. I'm glad that you, you know, you already reached out. We're already talking about this difficult situation. Okay, let's talk about Malcolm. Let's talk about Malcolm. We're going to do a stay close hot here. Um, it's time to go inside and Malcolm is not happy. Um, and he screams, this is bull and I don't want to. And so we're going to give Malcolm some empathy. How is Malcolm feeling? How is Malcolm feeling? How is Malcolm feeling? What's that empathy statement? We need a good emotion word. You're disappointed. Yeah. Mal I know you're disappointed, Malcolm. I said it was time to go inside. I know you're disappointed. I can tell. It's great. 
And again, I think that's a really good example of oftentimes people don't want to say that because they're worried it's going to make it worse. But acknowledging reality with that emotion is so important. He is disappointed. Tell him you see it. Any other emotions people thought of when they thought about Malcolm? He might also be frustrated or angry. Um, So we're really looking for an empathy statement. I see we're trying to connect in that. You're trying to tell him that you see how this is affecting him. Um, and really what it sounds like when we say something like, um, I understand you want to stay outside, um, but we need to go inside. We're really making excuses and uh, using lecture and logic to explain. So it's a form of coercion and we're going to try to avoid that. And to replace that, we're really just going to focus on the fact that Malcolm's having a hard time, he's disappointed, he's frustrated or angry maybe, um, you know, uh, depending on what that looks like, we really want to focus on the emotion that he's experiencing. You don't have to fix it, you know. Uh, really the thing that can help fix the problem here is not that Malcolm has to go inside. We don't have to deal with that. The problem is that Malcolm is having difficult emotions and he's having a hard time dealing with those emotions. And we can help with that by providing empathy and encouragement. Okay, so let's talk about encouragement. Um, what are we looking for? What might? What are some things we might look for from Malcolm um, that we could encourage? Might have to infer some things like, you know, that Malcolm was successful yesterday or been through hard times. kind of encouragement why might we be able to provide Malcolm? We could potentially say something about, uh, you know, <clears throat> about, um, you know, what's he doing right now? If he takes a deep breath, you know, Malcolm, I can tell you're frustrated and I just saw you take that deep breath. I think that's something really helpful. I know that when you take deep breaths, when you're frustrated, it often helps you stay calm. That's a really great thing to do, Malcolm. I can do them with you, you know, and model those things as you go. And again, I'm not modeling them in an attempt to get him to do that thing. I'm modeling them because I saw him do it and I want to be a part of that. Uh, I want to be a part of that. Um, okay, so I'm really in the moment with Malcolm. I've given him some empathy and encouragement. I'm going to keep doing these things until we're ready for the next step, um, which would be to direct some um, direct to some alternative behaviors. So I'm really going to focus on what's happening in this moment with Malcolm. I'm not going to try to get him to do anything else. Um, and my method of getting out of getting past this moment is to be to reflect empathy, to tell him I see how he's feeling and to find anything that he's doing to that. I want him to continue to identify it, name it <clears throat> and provide that encouragement about it being good for him to keep doing. I'm really going to avoid um, trying to convince him to do anything else or um, or point out. You know, all of those other things I might provide right now are really some example of coercion. They're going to be lecture and logic or criticism or um, those are probably the pretty big ones. Okay, you guys did a great job of really finding some empathy statements, encouraging statements. You did a great job of recognizing coercions. Um, <clears throat> this is the the uh, the end of the content that I have to share today, except I have some great resources because again, this is just an overview of a much more intensive training. And so for one, I'd like to offer you a full training um, based on these principles and you can take this QR code here um, to scan 
And this is the registration for tools of choice, which is the full uh, positive behavior support curriculum that this training, this overview is based on. Um, so there is that opportunity and I'm just trying to leave it up here on the screen. So you have a chance to get your phone and your camera and uh, pull up that website. So there's one thing that you could do um, <clears throat> to continue to learn more and practice these skills is attend that tools of choice class. Another thing that you can do is listen to these podcasts. Um, so if you uh, scan this one, it's going to take you to a SoundCloud that has 10 very short, just a few minutes each podcast about each one about each of the different kinds of coercion that we talked about today. So that's another resource that's available to you. I have one last one, the family coaching workshops, which are an opportunity to come and interact with a consultant, a, a tools of choice trainer, um, and work on these skills in a smaller environment and really focused on the family dynamics. Um, so that's the, like the types of relationships that we're talking about. People who attend those are parents, uh, siblings. Um, we've had a, a parent and their teenager attend together, um, but again, we spend this time um, talking about a few of these strategies and then focusing on practicing them and um, really getting good at, at implementing them. So that's the last resource that I have to share today. We're finishing a few minutes early. I'm going to look at the chat box and see if I have any questions um, that I can answer for folks. But other but otherwise, this is, concludes our class. I really appreciate your time, and I hope to see you in Tools of Choice uh, soon. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.